And, um, and today we are looking at another parable, which is the parable of the barren fig tree. Yeah? And that's in the Luke chapter 13. So open your Bible in Luke chapter 13. And when you are there, say I. Luke chapter 13. It's the third book in the New Testament. We have this, the Gospel of Luke. Dr. Luke. Yeah? I'm going to be a theologian, Dr. Luke. Right? <laughs> but before we look at the parable, we need to look at the context of this parable, which is found in Luke chapter 12. So just turn the page back in Luke chapter 12. Yeah? Luke chapter 12. Don't get confused. We're going to be in 13, but it's important. We go a little bit 12, yeah? So look 12. And here in NIV says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on guard against the east of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, when, when Jesus... Uh, uh, his teaching, he was, uh, he was teaching publicly uh, and thousands of people would come to, to hear him. But sometimes uh, Jesus is, is talking uh, to the disciples. I mean, even though they were in the, among the crowds, Jesus was talking to the disciples. And, and sometimes Jesus was talking to the crowd. Uh, and sometimes even to the religious leaders who, who were among the crowds. And here Jesus is talking to his disciples warning them about the religious leaders and it says be watchful of them yeah be careful because they they have a misunderstanding of god and that misunderstanding of god can infect everything else then he tells them in, in luke chapter 12 not to be afraid of you know of those who who kills who can kill a body but having fear from the one that not only can kill the body, but also kill the soul. And then he talks about judgment and justice. Then he addresses the crowd, talking about the end times. Look in chap Luke chapter 12, verse 54. Then Jesus turned to the crowd. So remember, he was talking to the disciples first. And then turns to the crowd and says, When you see clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, Here comes the shower. And you are right. When the, south, when, when the south wind blows, you say, today will be a, a scorcher. And it, it is like that. You fools, or other translation says, you hypocrites. You know how to interpret the, wed, the weather signs of the earth and sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. In other words, you can recognize the weather, but you cannot recognize the present time. You cannot recognize me as the Messiah. And with this idea of end times, we move to chapter 13. So turn in Luke chapter 13, verse 1. And it says like this. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. So here are the, the Pharisees, which are the religious leaders uh, of the Jews in those times. Um, uh, this is how they call themselves, the Pharisees, you know, for the Jews. I mean, the, probably the other religions, they have their own religious leaders called gurus. Uh, we have our in our Christianity, we have pastors and vicars and theologians, they are the spiritual leaders. Uh, in, in, in Islam, they have imam. So the Pharisees were the religious leaders for the Jews on those, in those times. And, and, and they come to Jesus with a question, but not necessarily to find, ans to find out the answer. Because they already knew the answer, because they thought as the religious leaders, they should know the answer. And here is this incident where, where Pilate sent people to kill some of the Jews in the temple. Uh, and, and, and because the Jews had this idea of, Oh, and they knew as religious, religious leaders, they knew why Pilate uh, did that. And, and their idea was that the, the more violent death you experience is because the worse sinner you are. In other words, the level of your, of your violence in your death corresponds to the level of your sinfulness that you had in your own life. 
And, and this religious leader, they thought, wow, you know, these, 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 these Gentiles, uh, these Galileans, these Galileans on, on the temple, they must have been very sinful people for God to send these guys to, to, to kill them like that. And the religious leaders used this event, this incident, to challenge Jesus for a response that they might use we may use it against, against Jesus later. And I like Jesus' answers. Look verse 2 and 3. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffer? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. The religious leaders, the, the, the Pharisees, they were looking down to those who died, thinking, phew, you know, I, I'm glad I'm not like them. You know, I, I, mean, I mean, they are so, so bad sinners that they kind of deserved what came for them. And Jesus turns this around and says, do you think these guys were worse than the other Galilean? were worse than the other Galilean? No. Jesus says no. But by the way, unless you change how you think about that, how you think about God, so that you can change your behavior towards God, you too are going to die like that. And then, and then Jesus uses a, a second illustration, verse 4. And what about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in, the, in Jerusalem? No, I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. So this illustration is not about, uh, about an, an evil person killing good people like the first illustration. It's an illustration that actually happened accidentally. Yeah? Now, it doesn't say why the, the tower fell. Maybe it was bad engineering. Yeah? But 18 people died and probably other injured. And, and, and Jesus says, do you think those 18 people died were the worst sinners? And that's why they died this way? So Jesus eliminates Im immediately the idea of, of the violent death that corresponds to your sinful life. And Jesus establishes here that Everyone, everyone is on equal grounds as sinners. What he says is, you are all in trouble. No matter how bad or how, how worse sinner you are, you are all in trouble. And then Jesus comes with a parable, which we're going to read it for today, verse 6. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted the fig tree in his garden, and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his, to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. So he tells them about a fig tree in a vineyard. Now, when I read this, I thought, first, aren't vineyard made by grapes? So what does a fig tree do in a vineyard? Right? But Jesus tells the story, you know, like I said, it's a fictive story. And Jesus told the story about this fig tree. And I just, just to, to, to remember, just to, to, to know, when, when Jesus talks about uh, fig trees, vineyards, or olive trees, he's always, always mentioned, or most of the times, he refers to, to Israel. And, and, and in this story, he says, the vineyard owner comes and sees this fig tree, and he says to the vineyard uh, gardener, to the vineyard carer, I've been coming here for three years. Three years. Who knows those tres? Three years. One, two, three. Yeah? Un, dos, tres. Yeah? Un, dos, tres. Yeah? Three years. Okay? I've been coming here for three years and checking on this tree and there is no fruit on it. And instead of taking up space here in the vineyard, and, and sucking all the nutrition that, that I, I rather give it to the vine, he said, just cut it down. Take it off. Now, it's an interesting picture here, because the idea of three years was uh, 
commune to the, to the Old Testament. Uh, because the people of Israel receive specific instructions of how to deal with the, with the fruit trees. Look what it says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 23. When you enter the land and plant fruit trees, leave the fruit unharvested for the first three years, and consider it forbidden. Do not eat it. Now, uh, uh, it, they wouldn't expect uh, for, uh, fruit for the first three years. But it would come every year to, to, to go and check up on the tree. And the same here. He found out nothing comes up from this tree. And then he says, just get rid of it. Because the tree, this tree, this fig tree, it was designed, it was planted with the purpose to bear fruit, and it doesn't. So just take it out. And I like verse 8. It says, the, the gardener answered, Sir, Give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get fixed next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. The guy who, who takes care of the, of, the, of the vineyard asks for more patience. Give more patience. Leave it alone for another year. And let me see what, can I, what, I, what I can do about, about that. And, and if still nothing happens, then you have the right to just cut it down. Now, it's interesting here that we are kind of left high and dry, we would say that, right? The story has no conclusion. I mean, we don't know what happened with that tree. After the fourth year, was it bearing any fruit? Was it cut down? So we kind of, you know, we have no idea about how the story ended. But I believe it's because this parable is a, is a prophetic parable. Let, let, let's see what I mean by that. There was a guy before Jesus. His name was John the... Come on. Everybody say John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He was a guy who baptized people. Yeah? That's why I call John the Baptist. I don't know if he was John Van, Van Horebeke or whatever. It was just the, John, John the Baptist. Yeah? John the preacher. I mean the preacher. Yeah? John the Baptist. And, um, and he was destined to, to be a forerunner for Jesus. Yeah? Then Jesus comes to the picture. Well, Jesus comes to the picture. But it's interesting that John the Baptist, when, when he, he was born and he started his ministry, um, he had only one message. He preached the, the message to the people. One message. Do you know what was the message was? Repent. When Jesus comes along and he starts his ministry, he comes with one message. He starts his ministry with one message. Look, Mark 1, verse 14 and 15, NIV says, After John was put in prison... Jesus went in Galilee, proclaiming the goodness of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has, has come near. What says there? Everybody says, repent. Repent and believe the good news. So John the Baptist came with the message, repent. And Jesus' message was, repent. Now, the, the, the word repent means to change the mind. It's not merely a change of mind, but, but a change of mind that, that results in a change of attitude and therefore affects your behavior. Change the way you think about God so that you will change the way you behave towards God. And then Jesus was preaching to the people for how long? Three years. Three years. He's preaching for three years to the people. He's preaching and he's checking up on people just like the owner on the vineyard. Seeing if there's any fruit to be bare. But because the people have not changed their mind about, about what they understood about God and, 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 and they missed this present time, they had not seen and understood the, the signs of the times of Jesus because of, ja of that, Jesus had to go on the cross. Luke chapter 23. Just a few pages. Luke chapter 23. Jesus is on the cross. 
who guides with him. This is very, very important. Verse 32 says like this, Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed by, with, with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals was also crucified. One on his right and one on his left. Now this is, pay attention here. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Now, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, is the same phrase that is being used in our text when it says, leave it alone for another year. Next slide, please. This is the text in Greek from Luke 23, uh, 23 verse 34 and Luke 13, our text. Yeah? Do you see any word there? They are, they are the same. The second word, yeah? Is the word forgive. Luke 23 says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Office, yeah? And, and Luke chapter 13 is when it says, let them alone is the same word, office. The same word when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, is used in our parable and says, leave them alone another year. And there on the cross, after Jesus has been, has been preached and, 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 and teaching for, uh, uh, for three years, Jesus says to the, to the keeper of the vineyard, Father, leave them alone for a little while. Give me a chance to dig around them and fertilize them. And just as in our parable, God answered that prayer. Because Jesus died on the cross and, and resurrected from the dead. And, and 50 days later, later after that, the, the Pentecost came. And God the Father gave us a second chance. He poured out His Spirit on His disciples. And not only the Jews would come to faith, but it says that 3,000 other people, that's the fruit for living it more. This prayer was, give it more time. And God extended His patience with Israel for about 40 years after that, after Jesus. When, you know, when year 70, when the big crisis came and the temple was destroyed and those people faced death that Jesus said it would happen for those who didn't embrace the present times didn't recognize the times of Jesus so what do we learn from this parable what's for us today I have three points number one we are all sinners we are all sinners Jesus doesn't doesn't deny the, the Galilean sinfulness when he responds to, to, to the news about them. Uh, nor when he brings up the event that, uh, of the Tower of Siloam failing on 18 people. He acknowledges their sin. But makes it clear that we cannot assume that they are worse than the others. By implication, it means that we are ought to consider ourselves no better than them. We are all sinners. And sin is not just things we commit, yeah? the evil we do. Sin is also includes the things we, we omit, the things we don't do. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Remember, it is sin to know what we are out to do and then not do it. It is a sin. So we are all sinners. Number two, repent. Repent. Unless you repent, you will die the same. And this is the key of the parable. Unless you repent, unless you, you change the way you think about God and turn away from this thinking, unless you repent, you will also die. Through Jesus, God gave us time to repent. He gave us time to repent, to change our mind, so that it will change our behavior towards God. And God is patient. And God's patience should not be taken for granted. 
Book Romans chapter 2 verse 1 says, You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad as you are, and, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and, and should be punished, you are con condemning yourself. For you, for you who, judge, who judge others, do these very same things. And we know that God in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you, judge, since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how, wonderful, how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn, to turn you from your sin? It's the same word, repent. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And He will judge everyone according to what they have done. Repent. God is just. And, and His patience will come to an end. And those who decided not to repent, not to change their, their attitudes towards God, not to embrace the Messiah, they will be judged. And the third point. God cares about results. God cares about results. This fig tree enjoyed a certain advantages that other fig trees couldn't. Because many fig trees, they grew, they grew along the, the, the roadsides, yeah? And they, they were, they were in, in essence, uh, wild. Yeah, wild fig trees, you know? No one fertilized them. No one, no one would care for them. You know, they had to survive in the rocky soils and no nutrition. But this fig tree was different. It was purposely planted in a vineyard. It enjoyed a better soil. The vineyard keeper uh, watched over, over that fig tree and, and, and he took care of it. He fertilized it. And they received much attention for the garden, from the gardener. God has placed you, God has planted you in his garden. And he cares for you. Gives you much attention. Gives you a lot of good soil and water, nutrition, so that you will, your life will bring fruit forth. He pours resources in your life and says, stay connected with me, stay rooted in me. Because, because I'm doing something in you that will change the world because of your results, because of your fruit. And because of the fruit of your life, you will show kindness and love and other things that God planted in you. If your life has been touched and changed by Jesus, it will show in the fruit that you bear. In the results that you bear. God placed you here. God planted you here in this part of the world. In this area. For a purpose. With a purpose. And he invested in you. He cared for you. With one purpose. And only one purpose. To bear fruit. God cares about effectiveness. God cares about fruitfulness. A changed life. A life that makes a difference. And when you make a difference, and your life ends on, on this earth, people will miss you. Because you are a gift to them. You are a blessing to them. You are a channel of God's grace to them. You provided wisdom and generosity and service and encouragement. You weren't just a consumer. You were a producer. You didn't just uh, take from everyone and everything, but you gave everything you have, and they were blessed. 
So my challenge this morning for us is identify areas of your life where you don't bring results. Identify areas of your life where you are fruit, fruitless, fruit, fruitlessness. Yes, fruitlessness. Without fruits. Let's put it this way. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Because where God has extended privileges, He expects returns. And today's story was left without ending. What would be the end of your story? This story was left without ending for a reason. Your story continues. What would be your end? Identify the areas of your life. We are all sinners and we need to repent. And when we repent, the moment you repent and the moment you die, in between there is life. And in this life, God cares for results that you bear. Amen, everybody? Amen.